I'm Susan Joy Alexander. As a first-time writer, I feel really privileged to be making this video about my upcoming memoir, A Spanish Love Affair. I'd like to thank the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts and the Thomas Keneally Library for their assistance. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Thomas Keneally Library, it is the oldest lending library in Australia. It opened in 1833 and is situated at 280 Pitt Street and has a wonderful coffee shop for its members. I'd also like to thank the Better Read Than Dead bookstore for allowing us to film this video in their shop. I started playing tennis when I was seven in our backyard court. Death matches against my brother John, who later became number four in the world. I didn't do quite so well. I hovered somewhere between 60 and 80. It was a bit hard to tell because there were no computer rankings in those days. Ours were hard fought battles, volatile matches. My father sat on the umpire stand trying to keep the peace. I won my first tournament at 11, the New South Wales Hard Court Championships at Canterbury Bankstown and many other junior and long weekend tournaments during my teenage years. I narrowly avoided an early marriage at 18 and instead left Australia and went overseas to play on the glamorous European tennis circuit. Between 1967 and 1973, I played in two Wimbledons and won 30 singles tournaments and 25 doubles. I must confess, however, that unlike my brother, I specialised in majoring in the minors and picking tournaments in beautiful locations, interesting and pretty locations, rather than the top tournaments. My memoir is written in two narratives. The first is in a series of vignettes, which I've slipped between each chapter. Snippets of my ideal childhood on the northern beaches, sun and surf. But this all changed when I was 11 and was sexually abused by my tennis coach. This is how it started. I'm in love. My tennis coach and I go for a walk on the beach. There's no one else around. He takes my hand and squeezes it. Shivers go up my arm. He touches me on the shoulder. Electric shocks race around my body. He pulls me towards him. His body is hard. I can feel every part of him. He kisses me. My whole body trembles. I desperately want something to happen, but I'm not sure what it is. I turn my face towards him and smile. The main narrative of my story goes from Narrabeen City to Northern Beaches to the Centre Court at Wimbledon, to Monte Carlo, to Casablanca, to St Moritz, Madrid, Santander, San Sebastian, Rome, and even behind the Iron Curtain in the then Yugoslavia and Romania. Mind you, I was totally oblivious of Tito Ceaușescu and, the, and Franco, the dictators in, in charge at the time. I'm also going to read you another excerpt. This is about playing at Wimbledon because a lot of people would like to know. I find it hard to believe that I'm about to play on the hallowed Wimbledon turf, the scene of so many long and torrid battles fought by fast champions. As a young girl growing up, I dreamt of this moment as I had laid sprawled on my parents' bed, sipping hot sweet tea and listening to crackling radio broadcasts from Wimbledon in the early hours of the morning. Now I'm here and it's about to happen. When the others arrive and I stand up on, on ready to go out on the court, I can't feel my knees. They've completely gone to jelly. Nor as hard as I try can I get the butterflies in my stomach to fly in formation. They are running wild. I make the mistake of looking up towards the, um, the stands and they appear to rise almost perpendicularly from the ground. I pray fervently to the God of all tennis players that I will play my best and not let my partner down or worst of all make a fool of myself. I step gingerly forward desperately wishing that I was a turtle and could just disappear into my shell. My brother John advises me to lob every ball and the tactic works. We lose, but only just. The good part is, as only the third brother and sister combination in the history of Wimbledon, we are the underdogs and the very much the crowd favourites. 
We are cheered loudly every time we win a point. Mum will certainly be very proud and happy as it has always her, been her dream for John and me to play mixed doubles at the centre court of Wimbledon. These two narratives merge at the end of the book. I came from a conservative family with overprotective parents. So as you can imagine, I relished the freedom of being in Europe. I was adventurous, impulsive, and at times foolhardy. With a definite predilection for red wine, I was not the run of the mill tennis players. There was no prize money in those days. So to avoid staying in Europe or in, in London during the winter behind a typewriter, on the off chance of getting a job at one of the tennis clubs in Madrid, I hopped the train to Spain. Spain completely captivated me. I just loved it. The relaxed manana lifestyle, the beautiful buildings, the wonderful art, the generous, open-hearted, valiant people, particularly the well-dressed and groomed handsome Spanish men, the music, the food, I fell in love with the garlic. Before long, I was also captivated by a charming Spanish man, Pedro Riviera de Flores, who I met at the Salubria Charmartin Tennis Club in Madrid, where I was coaching the top junior girls. It was love at first sight, but love didn't run smoothly. After way too hasty a marriage, cultural differences emerged and Pedro's mysterious past collided. Writing a book is not for the faint hearted. If I had known how hard it was, I would have put my pen down right at the start. There are many tricks of the trade to be learnt. I ended up having to discard the first two years work when I did a life writing course with Patty Miller. So my first tip for anyone who's writing is to do a course. My second one is to become social media savvier. As my mother would say, it's a necessary evil. These days, writers are expected not only to write a book, but they are also expected to promote it. And you do this by creating a writer's platform. So it's essential to get busy with, with this technology in order to build a career in writing. And my last tip is to get a good editor. I was very fortunate to find Drew Keyes, who did a structural edit early on in my book, and later on Janet Hutchinson, who proofread a Spanish love affair for me. It's taken 10 years to write my story, most of which I've sat on for 50 years. I think you'll enjoy reading it. Sorry. What particularly spurred me on to keep writing when I was in one of those writer's troughs was that I wanted to share my story and make people aware of how easily sexual abuse can take place. In my case, right under my parents' noses. When I told mum later on, she didn't believe me. I often wonder why they didn't pick something up. I completely changed as a person. I went from being top of the class to the bottom. Never did any homework. Couldn't concentrate, was a disruptive element in the class. I developed an eating order, peroxide in my hair and took up smoking, all of which I managed to keep secret. I disengaged from my family dropped my nice friends and went round with a bad crowd. I was moody, grumpy and hard to get on with. I still suffer the after effects today, as you can see. Patty Miller said in a recent interview with Wendy Harmer on 702 that writing a memoir is a bit like walking nude down the street. I certainly can attest to that. But as a former girl guide, I am prepared. I've purchased a large hat and some big dark glasses so that I can put them on when my neighbours read the book. I'm very excited to advise that you'll be able to read my book at the Thomas Keneally Library or, and purchase it at the Be Better Read Than Dead bookshop.